Hello, my name is Liga Rosendahl. I'm the Director on EU Cybersecurity Policy here at Microsoft Brussels, and I'm joined by John Lambert of the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center. Hello, John. Hi, nice um, to be here. Here in Brussels, we are very concerned about cybersecurity looking at policy issues, but let's think about the basics of cybersecurity. What is threat intelligence exactly, and why is this so, so important? Well, every organization has risks, but when you combine risks with malicious intent, now you have threats that you face. Threat intelligence is information about the threats that you face, and it helps people make better decisions by providing context. It gives decision makers situational awareness, and it helps people prioritize the kind of responses and preparatory work they need to do in order to deal with the threats that they face. Can you tell us more about what exactly your team does, and how does that defend customers, and how does that increase cybersecurity in general? Yeah, so I run the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center, and uh, one thing we realized at Microsoft is that customers, not they don't just have risk, but they also have adversaries. And as customers have moved from on-premises to the cloud, they have brought their adversaries with them. And so in order to protect them and give them the defenses that they need, we need to understand the kind of adversaries that they face. So in the Threat Intelligence Center, we focus on adversary-based threats to our customers. Um, that means we need to study the threat actors that are deeply studying our customers and our technology. So we in the Threat Intelligence Center study back and try to understand what the threat actors are doing, the kind of techniques that they use, and then build those defenses and information into the services they consume from Microsoft to better protect them. From your perspective, what is the motivation behind uh, those uh, groups that attack our customers? How do you see certain uh, incidents affecting customers? And, and could, maybe you can give us an example of a case of, a, of an attack. The motivations uh, run the gamut from purely financial related. Uh, they need information that organizations have or users have, and they're able to profit on that in some way, shape, or form or they seek to do damage to the credibility of the organization for some retaliatory purpose, um, all the way to, um, you know, the world is, is a geopolitical world and the threats mirror that geopolitical world. Mm -hmm. And so there is uh, competition, contest, and conflict in the world, and uh, cybersecurity just reflects uh, those things occurring. And, you know, some of the examples of threats that we've seen, um, uh, one of the vulnerabilities uh, that was important this year was an, a vulnerability called Bluekeep. It affected our remote desktop protocol. It was reported to Microsoft uh, by the British government. Uh, a patch was put out and uh, Microsoft and others really told customers to patch as uh, quickly as possible with this. Um, where threat information helps is you go from information about a vulnerability that is severe, so you need to put it out there, uh, to knowledge about a proof of concept exploit has been developed by somebody and published. So now there is the potential there for that to be used in attacks. And then escalation happens where now attacks are circulating in the wild and small sets of customers are being affected to it being exploited in mass. And knowing each step of that helps customers know how to accelerate you know, their protection and, and the approaches they're taking there. So at Microsoft, we protect against about 5 billion attacks per month. How do you filter out all, all the noise and get the really essential information that helps you identify these high-level threats? So it's certainly true that customers face a wide variety of threats these days, from commodity threats, just trying to you know, steal information from their uh, workers, to targeted threats. And it's important that we provide uh, security that helps eliminate and really prevent a lot of the basic threats that customers face every day. And that's important because security teams really need the white space in order to focus on the most important threats. So by eliminating commodity phishing and malware attacks, they can put the time and attention they need to into studying the threats that are very much targeted at them. Let me step back a little bit and uh, look at another associated issue that often gets put next to cybersecurity, which is privacy. How do uh, you balance the issues of privacy when looking at threats in the information that you process? For customers, we know for their data, whether it's on-premises or in the cloud, the privacy of that data is very important. The security of that data is very important. And also, they need to know that their data is going to honor the compliance requirements that they need to operate. 
And so when that data of theirs is on premises, they have to worry about threats as well, insider threats and those kinds of risks. But when it's in the cloud, they need to know that that data is safeguarded and protected and used in a way that's consistent with you know, how, they've, how they are engaging Microsoft. So at Microsoft, we have a number of both training and defensive controls meant to ensure the privacy security of that. Engineers go through regular training to make sure that they are honoring all those privacy and security requirements. And then we have operational teams the, uh, the, as CDOC, the Cyber Defense Operations Center, which is looking over threats to customer data at Microsoft and, and watching for it 24-7. Microsoft is a very global player, but I'm sure that you collaborate with lots of other institutions, whether that's within industry or government. Can you tell a bit more about how important this collaboration is in identifying threats? In the world of cybersecurity, it seems that we're all learning about attacks at the same time as they break into the news, but we're all defending separately. And that model just doesn't really work. We need to work and defend threats against threats together. And that means we need to share information about threats with each other, um, other companies and organizations in your sector with customers and Microsoft to better learn about these threats. Because when you're focused on adversary-based threats, one thing you realize is multiple customers, multiple organizations face common adversaries. And if you try to face those adversaries by yourself, you're always going to be behind and reactive. And when you find trusted peers at other companies that you can and other organizations that you can talk to and build a trusted relationship to talk about your incidents, to talk about the threats. Now you're learning faster about threats and that is really gonna help everybody. I think a lot of attention has been paid to the work Microsoft has been doing on identifying specific groups working on attacks against democratic institutions in Europe. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the threats you see against uh, by state actors uh, on democratic institutions? One of the actions we took was against a threat actor we call Strontium. They had set up several websites uh, to use in phishing attacks to gather passwords of users. And in particular, they uh, targeted uh, think tanks in the United States uh, and other governmental institutions. Um, one thing that's common when they set up these websites is they, they need them to look authentic, as authentic as possible, so they commonly use Microsoft brand imagery in them. And that actually gives us an opportunity to go to, go to the courts and seek a remedy in the courts. Uh, and our digital crimes unit specializes in this, where they, we can bring a trademark infringement case against those websites and then seize control of them. And indeed, we did that successfully against this threat actor called Strontium. And what we were able to do with that court order was take those domains, redirect them to a place at Microsoft where we could prevent them from being used in any malicious attacks going forward. In educating customers or citizens, it's always been, there's been a lot of emphasis on, on phishing is the, uh, the, the main uh, concern right now, or then it's ransomware that's the concern right now. What, what are the trends now that we are looking at that may not be grabbing the headlines? Passwords uh, and credentials are always a weak link for organizations. The organizations that are being more successful in dealing with these threats have moved to technology we call multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication or sometimes it's known as two-step authentication. All of those really refer to when you sign on to a website, uh, you're not just using a password but you're using some secondary device, maybe your phone or another hardware token, in order to prove that it's you that's signing into that site. And when customers take advantage of that technology, they really are able to defeat a lot of these kinds of phishing attacks that are aimed at them. Um, so that is one uh, common threat area that is very resilient today, and those are the techniques that customers are using to get in front of it. And ransomware um, has moved from a phenomenon that is affecting individual desktops and sort of ransoming whatever is on your computer to more sophisticated uh, threats where a set of hackers will hack into a network, spend the time to explore it, and then ransom everything on that network, and typically demand some payment in Bitcoin in order to unlock the network. And this is really affecting many municipalities all over the world. Uh, and that's sort of the, the current you know, uh, severe trend that we see. Anything related to artificial intelligence is, is, is very um, popular right now. So how do you see from your perspective, how will AI influence uh, cybersecurity? Is it a benefit? Is it, does it create more threats? Uh, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, so AI for defense is really helping speed response. 
And so, you know, many years ago, the model was there a threat would appear, uh, some human engineer or analyst would write a res, you know a signature to respond to that threat and then put that out there. And in today's time, that's just too slow. The threat has already done its damage. And so we're moving from a world of human in the loop uh, solutions to human over the loop. And what I mean by that is uh, we're building systems where we're through machine learning and artificial intelligence, so we're teaching the systems how to recognize threats themselves, and then they are automatically detecting and responding to those threats in real time. And that's really giving defenders the leg up they need to speed the response that they need. On the offensive side, I think one of the worrying trends is in this area of deep fakes, where they're really able to make a video, make somebody say something uh, that they want, and it's not clear if it's authentic or not. Mm -hmm and it's uh, difficult uh, to understand whether these things are true, and even if some expert can find that out and analyze that, it's hard for the public to know that that's occurred, and so the damage is already done. So that's sort of a troubling trend that we see continuing in the future. It's clear you and your team are making every effort to uh, protect our customers, but I think it's uh, uh, cybersecurity is a multi-stakeholder process and we need the involvement of citizens and civil society and government. What would be your recommendations to governments on policy decisions they need to take in order to assist the work of industry and to protect customers further? So one of the things that I think is true in, in cyber is that you know, nothing really gets better unless customers are able to defend themselves better. Mm -hmm. And um, a big part of that is actually focusing on the fundamentals. And that means um, having a regime where customers are able to do things like make sure they're running up-to-date software across everything that they're using, um, having updated security software, and then crucially investing in their people. We know in network defense that people are the greatest asset that companies have in that space. It's not some appliance or a machine learning algorithm, it is truly their, uh, their professionals they have and investing in them is very important. And then I think providing forums where organizations can talk to amongst each other, uh, share information about threats in a way that is trusted with each other, develop those important peer relationships across sectors between government and the private sector uh, where threat information can be shared and discussed and organizations can really prioritize what they're trying to do next. As a last question, what would you recommend each of us to do to improve our cyber hygiene? Well, I think at a as personal level, as a consumer, one of the most common weak links that we face are how we manage passwords. Every person has to deal with not just one or two sites where you need to sign on, but literally dozens or maybe a hundred. Uh, and so, in a way, the, the best possible advice is to just use a password manager. There are a number of them. Uh, and use that in order to manage and secure the passwords that you use to all your websites. And I think you know, that, that's a very concrete step that is, is something that you can do and recommend to friends and family to do to really protect the security of themselves online. Thank you very much for your time, John. Thanks.